This is Dr. Gerald Stucka, <clears throat> Extension Veterinarian Livestock Stewardship Specialist. I want to talk to you today about managing for weaning and backgrounding and talk about <clears throat> talk about this in terms of perhaps a not a mathematical equation, but perhaps a, a statistical equation and how many different factors go into determining whether cattle stay healthy or not, uh, perhaps before weaning and, and even after weaning. The first picture I have for you is just to <clears throat> remind everyone that this time of the year, if you have cows that haven't bred yet, you'll have a whole string of either steer calves or bull calves that haven't been cut yet chasing after cows. So it's kind of a sign that maybe uh, you need to uh, wean those calves and put them in a pen by themselves where they can thrive and do different and uh, do better on a, on a predetermined ration. I want to start here because I want to talk about where health costs come in and losing calves and treating calves come in. It's been determined that 50 to 70 percent of the cost of keeping a cow's feed and pasture. Uh, and if that's true, it's pretty easy to come up with 700 to 900 dollars per cow per year, which is a lot. And so if it costs us that much to keep a cow per year, where does our income come from? Well, it comes from how many calves we have to sell. And also the, what the cull animals that cows that have either showed up open or bred heifers that that are breeding and conceiving have come up open, and even some cow bulls. And then some people like to use the term live calves per acre. You'll notice that I don't use anything like weaning weights or pounds. All these animals have a value, and I'm more concerned with selling calves per acre of resource that you have. The subtractors from income, which of course includes disease, but it's open cows, stillbirths, weak calves, abortions and an actual disease like scours early on or summer pneumonias when they're still nursing the cow or even pink eye and foot rot uh, detract from from income because of the cost of treating and the labor and the time it takes to treat and then and then of course if we backgrounding our own calves or buying in calves that post weaning BRD is a loss and particularly if you lose one or even if you have to treat one it's a subtractor from income. <clears throat> This is just a relatively new North Dakota Farm Business Management uh, figures that I pulled up recently. And all I'm trying to point out here is where some of those subtractors from income come in. Come in. If we just take the beef cow calf average per cow, not looking at that far right column where they're, we're looking at with backgrounding, but pregnancy percentage on a group of cows, in this case, almost 300 cows over 12, 12 ranches, Pregnancy percentage is about 95.7, which is which is really good actually. And then some of those pregnancies will lose throughout the winter time up in the in northern plains, 1.8 percent. Culling percentage about 12.4 percent. You end up calving somewhere around 94 percent. And then by the time you wean those calves, you've got about 90.5 percent. That that really should somehow equal with that that 4.1 percent death loss. And sometimes you lose some cows and, and so on and so forth. So what, what it's giving you here is an idea of what many use as a determinant of how productive their ranch is, and that pounds weaned per exposed female. In this case, it's 492 pounds. And I know many of you have higher weaning weights than that. But when you include everything, when you include all those females that you put out to be bred with the bull from the year prior, and how many calves you weaned and what they weighed, that's the number that, at least in this data, data set, shows us about 492, almost 500 pounds. The average weight of the beef calf sold in this data set was 547. The average price per hundred weight was 153.45. If you look over there on the on the whole herd with backgrounding, the numbers change a little bit. Um, you got less. You got just a little smaller cow herd size that's doing that 185. Pregnancy percent is again really high, 97.3. Uh, we lose some of those pregnancies. We have a 15% culling percentage, 96.3% calving percentage. We weaned only 91.9. Um, to me, that looks pretty close to that 4.5% calf death loss percent. Uh, and there was some cow death loss percent as well. 
pounds wean per exposed female in this data set is about the same, 486 versus 492. An average weight of beef calf sold is 670 versus 547, but that's because we we grew those calves after weaning and hopefully gaining more dollars per calf. So maybe it's good to have some idea of what we expect in terms of sickness and even death loss following weaning. And I guess for many of, of you that raise their, your own calves, you wean your own calves at your place, you wean them for a period of time, might be 45 days, might be 60, might be 90, might be even longer. Uh, there does include some risk of death loss. And I've put that in at zero to 5%. 5% is way on the upper end that I would expect in the Northern Plains. And, but zero is within my expectations. Zero to maybe half a percent is where I would expect these things to be. What's really interesting, though, is that if we look even farther beyond our own, our own ranches and where that animal goes to be fed, that even when these animals go to a feed yard, and, and this is focused on the feedlots from K-State, steers coming in at 795 or 59 pounds, Heifers coming in at 721 pounds, or 721 pounds, and 175 days on feed for steers, 3.68 average daily gains, so on and so forth. Death loss, even at that weight, you know, you can see they're being fed for 107, approximately 175 days, but death loss is 1.7 for steers and 1.88 for heifers. You would think that at that, this time in their lives, that death loss would be considerably less. My point is, is that we haven't made a great deal of progress on death loss. We still see death loss in categories of animal where we would not expect there to be much death loss and certainly not much morbidity either. I'm sharing, I'm sharing this information with you just to give you a reminder that, that I can't see we're really doing any better. Uh, we may actually be do, doing worse over time. This is looking at focus on the feedlots death loss over a period of 20 some years. and death loss in the feedlot has actually gotten worse. So, and I kind of attribute this, uh, this is my speculation on the fact that we don't really do enough systems thinking. And, and by that, I mean, we're, what are the things from a management standpoint that we can control that may in fact contribute to healthier calves throughout their entire lifetime? So this is my, health production assurance equation. And I want to spend a little time in this and, and share some pictures with this is because I think this is where all of us need to think uh, when it comes to producing healthy calves and calves that produce and even healthy females as heifers and, and those females that last a long time in our herd and breed back every year. So I say in this slide, there's a relationship of calf health and expression of genetic potential to a set of risk management factors. Some of these things you and I have control over, and I would argue a fair amount of control over, and some not so much. So I have calf in the second bullet point, calf health and productivity equals, in other words, good calf health, good productivity, equals, and I've got FPT, and that's an acronym for failure of passive transfer. And I've outlined that a little bit better in saying failure or partial failure of passive transfer. In other words, some type of immune stress. When a calf is born and gets up and nurses quickly and doesn't have any difficulty doing it because it was uh, the right size coming through the birth canal, had enough energy and vigor to get up and nurse right away, failure or partial failure of passive transfer is, is basically not going to happen. So you and I have some control over that. And we'll talk about that as we get into the images that go along with this. Weaning stress, a psychological stress, is part of this health and productivity equation as well. How do we wean? What's my method? What's my management strategy for weaning? Commingling. Do I put calves together even on my home ranch from the same pastures or from a bunch of different pastures? That's, that's what we call commingling. It's a stress. It's not only psychological, but it's a social stress. There's a little bit of difference between those two. Environmental stress. When do we calve? What time of the year do we wean? Uh, are there things I can do to avoid some of that environmental stress? And again, we'll refer to some of those images I'll share with you. Nutrition. 
how have I wintered those cows when they're pregnant? How have I fed those cows prior to calving when they're pregnant? Um, have I provided enough energy and protein and, and provided trace mineral supplementation to those cows? Or are they under a great deal of nutrition stress? What kind of exposure have they had when they were pregnant or right before calving? Do they have a good functioning immune system? Have I vaccinated for some of the, the, the pathogens that I can vaccinate against? And finally, do we have enough labor to get this accomplished? And so there's a lot of things rolled into this, this huge equation. And I want to share some pictures with it that help us to think about this big system that we're trying to manage. I start here in this lower right, lower left hand corner with birth weight and calving ease. And so to me, both of those EPD traits are health and productivity traits. I want a calf that's born quickly, unless there's some abnormal presentation, gets up quickly and nurses quickly. And I want a mother that's been fed, appropriate, fed appropriately during the time that that cow was gestating that calf. Those to me are health EPD traits. When is my calving season? Do I, if I calve early in the, or in the middle of the winter, do I have enough facilities, enough barn space, enough bedding, enough windbreaks to carry that out so there's, there's not much stress on the cow, there's not much stress on that newborn calf, and there's not much stress on human beings that are trying to uh, accomplish the tasks that are required when we calve when the weather's not favorable? Or have I, can I change my calving season to a time of the year when it's more favorable or less risk of bad weather, albeit knowing full well that that changes many things as well. It changes your marketing structure. It perhaps even changes some of your supplementation strategies as later in the summer when we have lower quality forage, <clears throat> the, the type of grass, the availability of grass may not be the same when we're trying to rebreed breed those cows. <clears throat> some of those things can lead to calves getting sick early in life and obviously, if we look at this calf, we can <clears throat> probably determine that calf is not feeling well. It looks to me like it's probably got scours. And some of those relate to the time of the year that you calve and also to some of these factors here related to back to the cow, the in, uh, nutrition during gestation, and also bath, birth weight and calving ease and, and environmental stressors here. How do we wean those calves? Do we have we got a management strategy that allows us to low stress wean calves? Can we put them in a large enough area with tight enough fences so that the mothers can be alongside and they can they can uh, beller at each other for a number of days? Have we fed the cows and calves together prior to weaning so that they get over their commingling stress? Even though they're on the same ranch, they came from different pastures. Can I feed them together for a few weeks so they get used to one another? And they're used to eating by that time. And so that some of the stressors that are associated with weaning will be minimized. They won't be completely taken away, but they'll at least be minimized. And then some of that commingling, if they're all the calves are on the same ranch and bringing different pastures together, by, by feeding them together, you minimize some of that commingling. If we're buying in other calves and we're bringing several loads, trailer loads or we're mixing them all together, you are introducing a great deal of commingling stress into those cattle. And you need to, to figure out a way to manage them perhaps a little bit different. Maybe you have more pens, smaller pens, uh, fewer animals per pen. You load a pen uh, during a couple days and then you don't put any more calves into that pen again. Or maybe you have some other strategy that helps you manage some of those calves that you know are likely to become sick uh, after arrival. It could include, for example, giving all of them antibiotics on arrival. What kind of biosecurity and vaccination programs do I have in place? If I'm buying calves, am I convinced that I'm not bringing something into my place, for example, like BVD, uh, that can spread through the entire herd very, very rapidly? Do I have a sound vaccination program not only in my own home-raised home wean calves, and have I vaccinated them perhaps twice prior to weaning, and do I have a solid protocol if I'm buying in calves or am I buying calves that have already previously been weaned and vaccinated? So all of these things that I've talked about so far can certainly be, be managed. And when it comes to processing, do I have a low stress processing uh, environment or management strategy? Do I move cattle quietly and, 
and not quickly necessarily, but efficiently through the processing facility. What about low stress handling? This ties in with processing and loading cattle and working cattle. And um, most of us have made dramatic changes in the way we handle cattle. We, we've discovered it's no longer necessary to use words, just movements, and, and, and move cattle to where they need to go and let them figure it out in many cases. And all these things are under our control that lessens the risk of a calf that's looking like this that needs, that needs our attention. All of these things can have enough stress in the life of that calf so that it affects the immune system. And I'm just sharing you with a little, <clears throat> a little image here of, a, of an immune cell that's in our bodies and in the bodies of animals. And those cells don't work as well when those calves are under stress. Sharing this with you because this is an interesting slide. It's a, it's a case report that I got a number of years ago and I've used it several times. And I just want to share it with you because it, it allows you to think about things in perhaps a different manner. And my point is in sharing this with you is that sometimes we give vaccines too much credit. So a number of years ago, I received a, an email from a veterinarian in Georgia about a bull test station where they bring in young bulls. They're sent to the bull test station. And as you can see in the second bullet point, as per a vaccination protocol sent to a bull test test years ago, by someone at the vet school, okay? Incoming bulls must be vaccinated two to three weeks prior to arrival, which makes sense, with an IBR, PI3, BRSV, BBD type one and two. And of course, that's a viral component. They also receive Mannheimi, Hemolytica, Pastor Elamaltosida, Haemophilus somnus, and Clostridial seven way. And then at processing, the boosters are given using whatever vaccines have been donated. I think this particular colleague of mine was a little put out by the way this was done. His second question came, or a second uh, part of this history of this, this bull test station was this, typically processing in is around July 5 and the bulls are sold around December 7th. Within seven to 10 days after arrival, there are numerous cases of BRD, which is bovine respiratory disease. Years ago, we called this shipping fever, which in a way was somewhat appropriate which are treated and may be retreated and the process really runs to late November. That's a long time to be dealing with BRD. So his question was, if the protocol pre-arrival and processing was an IN, which stands for intranasal administration of a vaccine like TSV2, which is an old vaccine that we've used for years, or I might add in Inforce 3, and an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection of Mannheimia Pastorella vaccine plus Clostridial omitting the Haemophilus, would there be less B BRD? I'm just gonna answer this right now. Wouldn't make any difference at all. None. This has nothing to do with vaccination strategy. I'm gonna give you the answer right now. This has all, everything in the world to do with the stress of commingling. That's what's happening. These bulls are not going in pens by themselves. They're being commingled with pens all over the country, and that's the big deal. Vaccination has very little, almost nothing to do with the outcome of these cases of BRD. Just a little bit of comment here regarding some immunology principles, and this will come into play uh, in, in a few more slides. In very, very general terms, from the time an animal is stressed, until the time it starts showing signs, in other words, depression, high fevers, off feed. So from the time it's stressed to the time it shows signs and symptoms of respiratory disease or shipping fevers, about seven to 10 days. With a tremendous amount of stress, this could even be shortened even more. On the other hand, on the other side of the coin is the immune response takes time to begin. Three to 10 days to begin, longer with calves that have never been exposed and maybe peaks in two to four weeks. So you can see that if I'm dealing with calves that I'm buying in and I'm expecting vaccination to improve the, their health status and they've never been vaccinated, by vaccinating them on arrival, I'm kind of behind already, aren't I? Yes, I am. It's very difficult to vaccinate on arrival and change the outcome or to change the health status of those animals with on arrival vaccination, at least for calves that you buy in that have had no history of previous vaccination. <clears throat> Just a uh, uh, one slide on talking about vaccination strategies. 
I want to use only the vaccines I think are necessary, okay? Because there's a risk, and there's certainly a risk of respiratory disease. So I will only, only use respiratory disease vaccines, but I want to make sure the second bullet point is understood as well. I want to be reasonably assured that they work. So I want them to be necessary. I want to be reasonably sure that they work, and I want some information behind that expectation. In other words, if there's research or all I have observed it or there's some anecdotal evidence that the vaccine works, that gives me some level of comfort. And finally, number three, I want to make, I want to be certain that it, they're safe to use, that I don't have a bunch of injection site lesions, that I don't have some of the sweats in cattle. And as it relates to pregnant cows anyway, that I'm not inducing abortions in pregnant cows. But we're talking about respiratory disease in our discussion today. And so really the safety issue is it would be hypersensitivity reactions, injection site lesions, and maybe cattle just not feeling well after vaccination. And that does happen. You can't always predict it. Some cattle that you expect to, to really kind of uh, drop off, not have very good feed intakes after vaccination that have just arrived. They'll fool you and they'll go right to the bunk and start eating. And some calves that you don't expect to feel a little bit tough after vaccination, they will, on the other hand, uh, back up a little bit on feed and not look real great for a couple of days. This slide is here as a reminder to us that most vaccines require a second dose. Even modified lives, vaccines will benefit from a booster dose. So all I'm showing you here is on the left-hand side, on the Y, what we call the Y-axis, antibody concentration. When I give an initial dose, I'm going to get a little bit of a response. In really young calves, it's difficult to measure that immune response because many of those calves carry immunity from their mothers when they're really young. But in truth, if I was to measure a different response that we call CMI or cell-mediated response, I would be able to to measure a response, okay? So, but the point here is that when I come back a second time with that booster dose, and we're not sure exactly what the, the perfect time is for booster doses on most labels, it's 21, 28 days after the first dose. We've done some work at Streeter, at NDSU, heard out there looking at uh, some calves that we vaccinated somewhere between 8 and 12 weeks of age and ac actually getting a nice booster response 150 days later, which coincides pretty well with many of your management strategies. So do these programs work? Do these weaning and vaccinating programs actually work? Well, let's look at one. That now, this one was done some num number of years ago when I was part of this research project. It was back in 2003 but I think it still tells us a story. And I'll share that story with you here. So these cattle were originated in what we call the Southeast anyway, and they were purchased at the Joplin Regional Stockyard in Carthage, Missouri. Cattle were trucked to Decatur County Feed Yard in Oakland, Kansas, where they were fed until May. And they were shipped to XL in Dodge City for slaughter. And some of these calves were actually shipped a little bit early, and part of that's because of the market disruption we had in that year that the cow that stole Christmas with the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, encephalopathy um, episode that year. So that's where the cattle came from. That's where they were fed. So really, they were, this was set up to have four treatment groups. But because we started late, I'll just tell you right now that T3 there, the pre-vac pr program where the cattle were vaccinated but were not weaned, that one kind of fell out because we just didn't have enough calves in that particular treatment. So what we ended up with and what we really concentrated on was T1, which was the controls. These were unweaned calves of unknown health history at the time of sale. T2 at that time was a Pfizer program as wean vac calves weaned for at least 45 days prior to sale and had received certain vaccines. And the T4 was a similar wean program, steers weaned for 45 days and had a different, vac a different company's vaccines that were utilized in that uh, in that. This is the, the sickness rate. Morbidity means sickness. So 42.63% of the unweaned calves with unknown health history actually were pulled and had to be treated for respiratory disease. The other two programs are almost identical. The other 45 day and the wean vac, 15.4% of the calves were pulled and treated. This next slide just breaks this out a little bit further because it gives you a little bit better idea 
of the animals that were pulled once and pulled twice and pulled three times. And if you add those columns up on the right, you'll see where that's where that 42% comes in those unweaned calves with unknown history. So maybe a, a better way to look at this <clears throat> and a way that I look at this gives me a little bit I better idea of the health status of the calves. I just look at the first column. Uh, the percentage of steers actually pulled one time because we're never sure did these steers get pulled at the right time? Did, were they too late? Was the wrong antibiotic? And so on and so forth. So let's use these numbers. 26% 20, of the calves from unweaned, unknown health history were pulled and treated one time. The other 45-day weaning programs were like this. 13% for the, the one group and 11.69%. Obviously, no statistical difference between those two groups at all. Okay. What I'm sharing with you here is this disease curve that I, and many times, this relates back to this, when I talked earlier about how long it takes to develop an immune response and how quickly does disease result after a stressful period. So what I've done here is I've taken the weanback calves and compared them to the control calves and just constructed a disease curve. The disease curve is simply looking at the number, or it could be the percent, number or percent of calves that were pulled by day. This DOF on the bottom is days on feed. So what I've got outlined in this kind of maroon color here is the control calves. So I started pulling on those calves almost, almost on day one. Day two, day three, I had a peak here, day five. Day six, it went way down here. I don't know this for sure, but I'm speculating that this might be Sunday. And that if they would have truly pulled on Sunday, this thing would have continued right going up from here to here. It would have been a, almost a straight line. I, I don't know that for sure, but that's what I surmise. And then they treated a bunch, and then it falled off the next day, and they came back and treated more. This is more of a true disease curve that I would expect. And it's because we have calves that are unweaned and unknown health history. And they start breaking pretty early because their stress occurred way back here perhaps even at the auction market as they were commingled together and then they were commingled at the feed yard. And now I've got this scenario taking place. So 26% of these cattle were treated at least one time for BRD. We'll contrast that with these weanback calves. So this weanback means they're weaned for at least 45 days and vaccinated. They really didn't have much of a, um, a disease curve at all. The highest point here was on day five where they pulled five animals, which is interesting, but really didn't continue up from there. They had a decline the next day, again, probably Sunday, and a few more. And what it, here's what it points back to, is that commingling occurred way back here sometime. So by the time they were sold in Joplin and got enough animals to put, make a pot load, it took a number of days before those cattle arrived and so that's why this seven to 10 day incubation period fits in with what I'm looking at here. What's really interesting about these, there's two really interesting things in this slide here. In, in, in treatment two and four, and if you remember that both of those were the weaned and vaccinated animals, they identified six BVDPI animals. You remember in that slide earlier, I talked about BVD and if you have a persistently infected animals, those animals will actually uh, spread that disease within a pen, within that group, very rapidly. So there were six of those animals that were in those two groups. They remained in the pen. Three remained healthy, interestingly enough. Two died, and one was sold early. So we had tremendous exposure in these weanback calves, and yet they held pretty strong throughout. Some of these late pulls may have been due to that, but the fact is that we're vaccinated, that 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 virus was spread into that pen, probably made a huge difference on whether those, some of these pulls are related to that, but it also points up to the fact that weaning those calves prior to them coming to the feed yard and make sure that their vaccination history was strong has contributed to those calves staying as healthy as they, as they could. There's some really interesting points to make in that slide. This is death loss. 1.2% for those with unweaned, unknown health history, 1% for the 45 day, and 03 for the weaned back calves. All this gives here, all this tells us here, is that these calves here were 4.2 times more likely to die than the ones in this 
group right here. The problem is to sort this out, we'd have to have much higher numbers. Even though this one tells us it's 3.5 times more likely to die than this group, I don't put a whole lot of confidence in this in these numbers here because the n, the number of animals involved in here, and the number of animals that actually died was really low. Um, another interesting point that I want to make here, when I combine t controls, the ones in the two separate weaned and vaccinated groups, and I looked at all of those that became sick and all of those that stayed healthy, in other words, they were never pulled and treated, there was a reduced average daily gain by 0.43 pounds per head per day uh, through the finishing period. 336 head were, were treated in these three groups. They had average daily gain of 3.07. In the groups that stayed healthy, there was 1,100 head, 3.5 uh, average daily gain. Interesting. Uh, in, in the fact that even though these cattle perhaps were treated early, there's still a cost. The cost of treatment, the antibiotics of labor is one thing, but you can see that performance, and we also know that carcass quality becomes impacted. I want to share another case report with you, a different one than I shared earlier. But again, it highlights some of the things that, that I see that are some of the main risk factors that don't get paid attention to in some of these home-raised, home weaned calves. These are five to six weight calves, approximately 400 had spring-born, approximately six to eight months of age. Calves had been weaned into a common pen by groups over a time period of four weeks, beginning in late September and into the month of October. Approximately three to five weeks after the first group was weaned, clinical signs of respiratory disease were observed. They had a number of calves that appeared ill all in one day. They were treated. A small number died. The veterinarians that were attending this, uh, these calves uh, recommended administering an antibiotic, and then they boosted them with some different vaccines. The outbreak was slowed, and two calves have died since the intervention. Whoops. Let me back up if I can. No, I guess I can't back up here. What I wanted to tell you is that in that last slide, though... Th if you'll recognize how they weaned calves in that situation, they weaned them over time. So they were commingling new groups of calves into that group uh, over time. That's the reason, and corn harvest was going on at the same time, so they were shorter labor. So the risk factors I was talking about early on, they were shorter labor, corn harvest was going on, they weren't paying attention, they commingled calves together, their feeding system wasn't great. They had hay feeders. They had a bunk line that only could feed 150 animals at a time, and yet they had 400 animals in the group. So this had nothing to do with vaccines. Um, it had to do with labor, commingling, and feeding. And 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 those are the <laughs> those are almost always the components I find when I am investigating some of these problem herds. Just want to spend a little bit of time at the end just reminding you that antibiotic use is under scrutiny in this country, if not in others, but certainly in this country. And I want you to visit with your veterinarian about what antibiotics to use, uh, what the dosage is, how to administer them, and, and of course, withdrawal times. I also want to remind you that when it comes to pulling and treating cattle, treat these things as if it's life-threatening. Don't pull cattle in the morning and wait till the afternoon before you actually treat them. And I know we get short of labor. There's too many things to do in one day, and sometimes we're overloaded, and sometimes corn harvest takes place. But the life of these animals is important as well, and so treatment has to be prompt. Use only antibiotics on arrival and or on the groups of animals if you really need them. Uh, High-risk animals where you're commingling a bunch of cattle from different places, different auction markets, those I would consider to be high risk, especially if they're balling calves, especially if they've been kind of uh, maybe even more than one auction market. It does make a difference on the health manage management of those cattle. A couple comments about the veterinary feed directive. Remember that we, we do have uh, permission to use antibiotics in the feed, and they can make a difference on managing cattle. But you need to involve your veterinarian to write you a veterinary feed directive and that he will write, give you the dose and how it's to be used and the length of time and so on and so forth. So it's an important component. It's an important tool that we can use to manage some of these disease risks. And and currently there's there's relatively what I would say easy ways to 
uh, put together these veterinary feed directives. Again, visit with your veterinarians. By now, many of your veterans know exactly what they're doing with these and can put you in the right label, the right category, and the right dose and figure out how much you need. Just to finish up, uh, this was an interesting um, survey that was done through CattleFax. And <clears throat> this talks about USB herd information. And I want to zone in on a couple things here. I would like air. Let me just, uh, I want this one right here. Do you have a vaccination plan for your cow herd? Uh, this NP stands for Northern Plains. That's us. 79% have you have developed it on your own, which is surprising me. 17% uh, with your veterinarian. Please use your veterinarian to help you design your vaccination programs. And then uh, where do you gather? No, where, do you regularly use antibiotics? And it, it talks about in feed or water or injectables, so on and so forth. And where do you get your advice? In Northern Plains, 52% of a year get your advice from, from veterinarians. I want that to be one hundred percent of you okay go to your veterinarian and ha ask him or her about what antibiotics I need to be using uh, what they are set up that treatment schedule with your veterinarian and and demonstrate to our public that we use veterinarians in a judicious and, and wise manner covered a lot of ground in this backgrounding talk but when you want to talk about health and productivity maybe there's a checklist that you follow and that checklist should have all of these things in it because this is part of producing healthy calves that are productive. Maternal immunity, calving season, weaning season, commingling, environment, exposure, nutrition, immunity, and as it relates to vaccination, and finally labor. These, this is the management equation that is under your control, yours and your veterinarian and your, and your nutritionist. You pay attention to these components and you will indeed <laughs> produce healthy calves that are very productive for, for a long time. So thank you very much. I always like to finish with this. You and I have, a, have been given a social license, if you will, to raise cattle. Most of us raise cattle on a great deal of forage. And I love this reference. It says, he causes grass to grow for the cattle and crops for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. It's our stewardship responsibility to the animals. It's our stewardship responsibility to the ground that they're on, and it's our stewardship responsibility to those of us that uh, that consume this these these food products that uh, come from from the earth that we that we live on. So thank you very much for listening in. I hope this was valuable and beneficial to you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.